Well, thank you so Hello. much. Oh, it doesn't feel like we need mics, does it? <laughs> we really you, need you guys should come close and sit, <gasps> sit with us. <laughs> Hello. Come up close up here. If you can, if you want. Yeah. Don't, don't let us. <laughs> um, so... It is true. I've had the joy and pleasure of working with Isaac to curate the exhibition that is uh, uptown right now at the Jewish Museum. And um, uh, I will tell you that it's been really a super joy and really a lot of fun to, to put this together. Um, it's been a, a, a kind of process that started about three years ago. And um, yeah? Yeah. And, um, and, and is now there. It's a real show. It's yes. really there. And I thought um, what I might do is let us take you on a kind of insider sort of mini private tour of uh, a bit of the show so you can see what it what it looks like and uh, of course we have a catalog that goes with that exhibition and um, these are these are all things that uh, that we didn't have a, a year ago even six months ago I know there had never been a book there had never been an exhibition there had never been any of those amazing things. <laughs> when did we shoot that two years ago right yeah 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 so um, I have a clicker let's see if this will take us so this is um, this this is what you encounter as you uh, arrive at, at the exhibition. And um, it's something that is very, I think, very near and dear to Isaac's creative process and to what he thinks about and what he does, which is this really beautiful wall that you see in there. Those are all actual fabric swatches of many, many different colors. and. You can see a little bit better now. This wall is about three times as long as the way you're seeing it now. Fabric pinned up on boards, and it goes really entirely through the color spectrum from one end to the other of scraps that you collected, yes? Mm -hmm. so, so swatches, yeah, swatches that I collected from the very first days that I was interested in the subject. And, um, and if you notice on top, there are little boxes wedged into those little squares. Those boxes are how those pages are organized. The boxes have little swatches on the outside which indicate whether it's a red box, a purple box, or a yellow box, or a pink box. And then the pages stack inside the box. And those boxes sit in my studio, in my personal studio, my small studio in, on 12th Street. And I use them constantly. And you know, I haven't had them for a while, and I'm sort of at a, a loss. Because they're in the it's, museum. Yeah, it's really hard for me to think. I mean, even <laughs> though I don't use them that often, I, I use them. And I was thinking about a project the other day, and I was thinking, oh, I'll just go to the boxes. And then they weren't there. And then they're not there. Yeah, yeah. that's true. But that's you, really never, true. you never actually imagined that this would be in an art museum. Museum, or that it would be so beautifully. Oh, that it would look like you know, like, like the most beautiful installation, the prettiest wall in New York. Oh my God! <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's funny, like that represents most of the boxes. There are some boxes that were not, you know, and someone has them somewhere, and someone has cataloged. That was the thrill of working on the show, is that museum kind of installation is so much different than what we're used to as people. Museums, like, you know, someone knows exactly what box every single one of those, because like, I think they were they were organized chromatically, and sometimes mm -hmm. the boxes, you know, it's kind of like for show. But there are pages that are missing in order, and I do think someone at the museum knows exactly how they go back into the boxes. Well, that's I know both, you do. I, I know do, you do. I do, but that's <laughs> both like sort of, you know, really impressive and also a little pathetic, right? <laughs> that someone had done had, has done all of that crazy, crazy organization. You know? Well, like, you know, you. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, like museum people are a whole breed unto themselves. Correct. You know, like yes. case in point, there was a dress that we wanted to use for the exhibit, that poppy printed dress yes. that was at the Met. It was mm -hmm. an archive at the Met. And they were very happy to lend it to us if we complied with several crazy demands that they made on yeah. that thing. Like we couldn't show it at a light 
above a certain level, above right. three candles or something like mm -hmm. that, because it would damage it, and we couldn't have it like I don't know how many feet from the edge of the some a lot of different, and so we ended up like not using it and making the dress again, you know, remaking the dress, which is you were part of that process. But I just find it so kind of fantastic, and it's like one of those things that you think I just want to go dust. I want to become like someone who dusts at the Tate or something, right? Or like at the at the at the British Museum, like underneath those crazy domes where they have those birds. Yes. Where is that again? That's in the British Museum. That's in the yeah. is that in the British Museum? I think yeah. you're right. Okay. I want I want a job like that where it's incredibly mindless and yet totally mindful, right? And it, it involves a, like a feather duster. A feather duster or an iron or something, yeah. Or an iron, yeah. Exactly. You're, you'd be good at that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is not to say that museum work is that, because it really isn't. Like, well, even for those installers, it isn't. Indeed. But, yeah. but, but to take us back to our tour, um, oh, right, our museum sorry. tour, um, and, and what, what I, I just picked a couple of pictures so that you could get a little feeling for what it, what it feels like. Has anyone here had a chance to, to go by and, and see this? Oh, goody. Yay. Goody. Okay. Um, it, it's... Um, one of the things that I will say about this, in terms of how we got from, you know, a lot of stuff in an archive, and yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff that was up in this town in upstate New York that kind of specializes in just storage archive spaces. storage. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we went and got, um, you know, we got the tour of the storage, the storage space. We spent, a, you know, quite a few days there, and there were many, many things from which to consider, to choose, to, to evaluate, yes. to um, think about what kind of repair would be involved and, and what really belonged in this show. And it, and it was hard to get it down to 42 looks on mannequins. Um, that is what you will see when you see the exhibition. But one of the things that is sort of a big theme, especially in this gallery when you first walk in, comes from those swatches, so it leads you in, but this notion of color, especially big color. And mm -hmm. and you, you say, I don't remember when you told me this, but you said that um, color is the greatest luxury. And I really thought in terms of like luxury, what we experience in terms of color and how emotional it can be and how evocative color can be and how attuned you are to color. Which is which is what we wanted to try to try to give that sense or or give you a sense of that mm -hmm. when you first walked into the show. And how many and how many really and how many bad interpretations of color there are in the world? You yeah. know, like mostly bad interpretations of color, right? I mean, I'm sorry to be so negative, but that's what I think is true, and. Um, and, and like, and the place color has, the sort of pathetic place that color has found in our world, you know? It's a terrible thing to, to acknowledge, right? It's like the best thing in the world and it's just like, mm -hmm. people don't, they're too afraid of it or it's too, like, I don't know what, it's too complicated, it's too time consuming and so it just gets, um, what's the word, it gets relegated to really weird, bad place, to a weird, bad place. But Sorry, I think I mean that, that when that was, I think that when you were considering that, so if you look at what we put in this exhibition that yeah. came from your first runway show, mm -hmm. so 1988, right. first runway show, which we watched the videos of it, and the, the show actually starts off kind of calm mm -hmm. and kind of quiet and subdued and, and not adventurous in terms of color, and then... Boom! I mean, it really hits, and then there's 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 a number of things that that um, not necessarily from what you see here, but a number of things that come down the runway that I think make a big. I'm not sure moment. what would have happened if I had not done all of that color in my first show. I'm, I I think about this all the time. You know, like I. Oh, it's like, you know how like some dogs just do the opposite of what you want them to do? You go like sit and they walk away and they just don't <laughs> want to listen. Because they're just willful and they know you want them to do something so they just won't do it, right? And for a long time... Some people I kind too of, are like that. Me, yeah. me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and for a long time I regretted this idea that people thought like that color was such a big important part of my work. And it is, but like, you know, and, and I did sort of architect that show 
which started with a bunch of gray passages and brown and black. Mm -hmm. And I think it was thrilling already. Like, I think I had them, you know, I really do. And you could tell in the room, you, you knew it, like you felt that they were really riveted. But then something happened when I showed all that color, when it amped the whole thing up a little bit, you know? But I didn't mean it to, I wasn't, I wasn't going, oh wait, now this is what I really wanted to say. Because the first sort of, I don't know what, like 20 passages, which are mostly kind of, like we refer to them as neutrals, right? They were kind of setting a groundwork and setting a pace for something and saying a lot and and you know like and they were saying like this is what the world looks like to me this is what I'd like to do these are the clothes I'd like to this is my thesis I mean I have to say the first thing you do is really hard the first collection you do or I imagine the first if you're a painter the first vernissage or whatever it is mm -hmm. that's probably very hard mm -hmm. because no one knows what you're doing yet and unless you do something entirely instinctual, you know, which is what one does, right? But it requires more kind of thought because they don't know who you are and they're about to. And unless you tell them exactly what to expect, you can make a mis you can make a bad mistake right. on your first collection. The second one, it's a it's something already right. that's it's a wheel that's been it's like right. you're starting to push the wheel and then the wheel starts to turn, then the wheel turns and it starts turning and turning and turning, but starting to push the wheel. So I, I wonder a lot about you know, what would have happened if I didn't show those colored things, you know? Well, you sent a clear directive and it was yeah. a message that yeah. was heard loud. And that's the thing is that people responded. Was it a mistake? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> this, um, this is another image that I kind of love because it features one of the projects you did in, as a collaboration with yeah. the artist and illustrator and beloved dear friend Myra Kalman. Mm -hmm. And the the two pieces that you see that are black and white here were done with Isaac in that he asked Myra to create some of the uh, drawings. So he, she, she made these swirls and harlequins and mm -hmm. lots of different kind of simple, basic patterns. Yeah. And then you took them yes. and did well, what? I was in San Francisco and I saw like one of a million collections of the like Diaghilev kind of costumes, Ballet Russe. It was a really good show at the De Young of Ballet Russe costumes. And there was a room that was all Matisse and it was all black and white and it was kind of... Um, naive paintings, naive black and white paintings on, you know, on clothes. And it looked like they were all kind of, you know, like he threw a bucket of white paint on something and then waited for it to dry and then just took a black ink with a big fat brush and just drew things on it, you know. And it was so inspiring. And, and so I thought, like, I have to do this. I have to do this kind of, like, naive, black and white, gesture -y kind of, almost like Japanese or something, right? Like this idea of just dots and stripes. It, it, it kind of came to me. And then Myra was on her way to San Francisco and I actually said, I was like, you know, don't go <laughs> see this show because, you know, it's going to, don't go see it. Which meant, again, Which like meant, you tell your colleague, don't yeah, sit, uh -huh, and the colleague right. <laughs> will then finally sit, right? But, but anyway, the point so is like... Of course she went to see it. Yeah, no, yeah. so she, of course she would see it anyway, right? right? And But then when she came back, you know, we talked about this idea of doing doing just plain things that you would see on clothes, like dots, stripes, checks, mm -hmm. and for them, and like, you know, zigzags and checkerboards and harlequin, you know, this kind of diamond right. box, diamond thing. Right. And she ended up doing, you know, swirls and anything that felt like it could be a very simple clothing, apparel-ish type print, right? And it's funny that we picked the swirl thing because it's a little bit off point, right? She did so many stripes and so many checks and so many dots, right? And each and every one of them are divine. Yes. And, um, and you know, we kept saying, no, we're not referring to Matisse. We're not talking about Matisse here. Not at all. Not at all. But of course, I think they are directly, you know, inspired by those costumes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> trying not to be inspired by something you are completely inspired again, you know. But. And there were hundreds of textiles made, hundreds. Like that swirl came in linen, silk, chiffon, wool. I'm not kidding you. Yes. Ten and or if fifteen. You, if you and go. there were like there were like twenty prints, and each 
fabric. I was like, you know, crazy. I just yes. kept ordering. And it was this one mill who made them all and she just accommodated us. And it was like, you know, a jillion dollars in fabric. Yeah. I just for the that. samples, just for the samples for the show. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, go on, go on. I love it when you have a big budget. Yes, I like big <laughs> budgets, yeah. Well, um, if you go to see the exhibition, you'll see that there's a film at the end of the at the end of the exhibition and a lot of the things that are here in the show are also in the um, in this film that you'll see so they kind of come to life and from the runway the runway moment from when when um, they were first debuted I wanted to just I have just a couple other things to to uh, yeah see if we can scroll through yeah uh. there's that one oh <laughs> This, this is a bit of an icon, this piece. This is called the Totem Pole Gown. Um, it was made in 1991, Fall 91, and it kind of rose to great stardom because um, on the cover of Time magazine, Naomi Campbell was shown wearing this dress for an article about supermodels. And it was actually an article about how much money supermodels are making, but th she happened to be also wearing this this dress, but th this this dress um, came from a lot of things that you were thinking about, um, mm -hmm. images, iconography, things that that you had picked up. Your you're kind of a collector and a scavenger exactly. and find these things. Yeah, and, and also it came from a, an instinct more than anything. You know, it doesn't, it's not like you go into something saying, I'm going to make this collection that remarks about such and such and such a thing. You go like, oh, I saw the funniest episode of F Troop last night and there were like, you know, Indians in it. And <laughs> Right, I'm not kidding. Or like Go Go Gophers or something, like cartoon mm -hmm. about Indians and, right? And, um, and then in the, like, then you look back on it a million years later and you go, it really does come comment about this place, uh, this place about this, how we do that to cultures, how we make them into silly things like totem pole dresses. And you know, I will say another thing about the totem pole dress, people like refer to it all the time as a really icono I iconic piece of mine, and I can't believe it. I can't believe that that silly dress is like, you know, compared to some of the real, like, right. you know, design right. things, right? That's like a joke. It's like a visual joke. Right. It's also gorgeous, and it's all embroidered by hand and it's fitted and it's made right. like a couture dress you right. know but it's also to me like it's not exactly the highest common denominator that dress it just right I mean it's really not it's extremely visual and um, and that's not bad I mean my work is visual but I like to think that the dearest dearest part of my work is not visual right you know um, and that's where I defer, I think, from a lot of designers. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what things look like. I don't, mm -hmm. you know? I don't know what I care about. I care about what they feel like, how they work or something. You know, I'm very kind of into, um, what? Economy and saying something mm -hmm. and, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Like being brief and being witty, yeah. right? Um, and somehow political, just kind of going like that a little yeah. bit. I don't care so much about the visual aspect of it, and I find that that's the best way to get these results, these visual things, you know, yeah. right? Um, and there's a quote that, like, you know, people go like, oh my God, you said the best thing in the world, which is, I like black or something, right? It's like, I did not, and that's a stupid thing to say, right? <laughs> but then, then there are other things which I've said, which now I can't remember because I take too much Xanax or something. I was going to say something and now I forgot. Okay, thank you, Chi. Well, no kidding. One but of the what? things you said, though, just now yeah. that, that I think also uh, that struck me over and over again as being really important is that you could take a moment to have a little bit of fun and not take yourself quite so seriously. Like, you know, it, it didn't all have to me be... Me, personally? You... Oh, I only had fun. Well, I never I mean, took myself seriously. Yeah. I only had fun. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, um, but, but there is this kind of thing about fashion which kind of insists on being, like, very, very visual. And I don't blame it. I mean, I love visual things. But, um, but... The best visual things come from a very sort of unvisual place, I think, you know? Did you see that Degas show at the... Um, at no, the, how at is the, it? Oh, my God. 
you're really? gonna die. He was the best artist that ever oh lived. God. Yeah, forget it. Did you see it? Did anybody see it? Go see that show. <laughs> because, again, it's like not so visual, you know? It's just the soul of like going out and looking at something and coming back and making the tiniest little thing and then making multiples, right? Like you make prints. Forget it. It just blew my mind. That was the best show. Wow. Like I want to stop everything and just like, you know, be Dega now. But, sorry. <laughs> well, we do think of you as a polymath. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, I, th I, I think that uh, I, I brought this one along too. I, yeah, I love that dress. I love this dress. I like that dress better than the totem pole dress. I, I don't know, know you why. do. Because yeah. it's, it's just like, it's like sort of more, it's a funnier dress. It's like more kind of style. If there's something stylish about it and also not, it's not as visual, right? right. Even though it's, it's kind of like a right. joke. It's an underhanded wit. It's an underhanded thing. It's sort thing. of, mm -hmm. it's just like under the surface there. Yeah, and also, also, there's like a thing about like a love of textiles in that thing, right? Yes. Like a love of textiles. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so you really guys see that, that this is kind of a little riff on the elevator pad of those packing blankets that are in the U-Haul trucks and stuff. Yeah, like or that. inside yeah. of elevators, exactly. Yeah. And I promised yeah. you that I was going to make you elevator pads. That's my next installation there. I do, does it have to be under the time? Do I have to get it in by August? Or I do. <laughs> Museums are tough. I know. Why not necessarily? Why not? Exactly. Why not? Exactly. I mean, it looks like a funeral. It looks like a casket in there. So why don't you it does, right? I will do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to introduce Claudia Gould. Claudia Gould. She's she's actually the mastermind who thought of the idea to have an exhibition about Isaac. I think she happened to run into him somewhere and she got this No, she did flash. not. No, we live on the same block. We and all yes, live on the same block, well, which is do, crazy. Yes. <laughs> um, and, but Claudia, this, this is your idea. It was, it was, it was truly your thought, so mm -hmm. we, we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you pleasure. know, that dress, actually the top of that dress is made of a series of grosgrain ribbons, which is like my other favorite thing. Because yeah. grosgrain ribbons, you know, you can mold on an iron. You can shape them all different ways. So it's cool. the best material ever. It's so cool. And, yeah. and, it, and it really is. You, you can see ribbon, like layer by layer, ribbon by ribbon. Mm -hmm. And it's just And it's made. all applied by hand. It's really fabulous, it's that really, dress. That dress, and it's just so light. It looks light, and it is light. It's like feather feather light and there is I know right that's that's a beautiful that 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 quilting is is made of lamb's wool and silk yeah, yeah. so that's nothing it weighs yeah. nothing but I also like I love the way that carries on a tradition of a kind of American humor you know and there are some great European dresses some but not all not all European dresses are great just because they're madly constructed and giant constructions and fabulous colors and visual beyond belief, it doesn't make them that good, you know? Okay. But like, if, and, and at least to me, because I'm not from that part of the world, I'm from, you know, this kind of country where, in, in which we actually still value, I don't know what, education, regionality, etc. You know, you think about like Millicent Rogers, you know who she was, Millicent Rogers. She was this like fabulous socialite heiress and she loved the Southwest and she would wear a lot of turquoise jewelry yeah. with white shirts and giant ball gown skirts and Charles James made clothes for her and everything. Mm -hmm. And she was like sort of a drag queen, you know, like an early drag mm -hmm. queen. Mm -hmm. But I think she would have loved that dress because she'd say, oh yes, that's my elevator pad. I'm living for that. You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, yeah. It's the dumbest thing in the world, an elevator pad, well, right? It's, but it's, it's also humble. quite beautiful. Like sometimes you're in the elevator, you're thinking, I only make, I'm only making this trip. <laughs> it's only possible thanks to these elevator pads, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I have one more here for us. All right, that. I, yeah. I had to bring this one along, too, just because there's, there's a big message here that I kind of adore, and that is that, you know what, ladies, Isaac is going to allow you to be absolutely elegant and go to a, a ball and bring your, your newborn child with you. And Why miss why? the party? Yeah. Exactly. That's what the name of that should be. Why miss the party? <laughs> why miss the party as a four-week-old? Right? Um, but, um, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, 
It's true about women. They reproduce, right? We forgot. Oh, well, no kidding. Like even go. models sometimes end up having babies. <laughs> so, yeah. And I love that because that's, that's the best, right? That's the most. And, and no children were hurt in the making of that uh, program. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing on time? Oh, questions. You would like some questions? We would love some questions. We, we, we opened the floor. What's that? Do we want a mic? You're into color. You're wearing black. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd love to know how your apartment is decorated. My apartment, you know, I mean, because I'm actually wearing navy. Did you notice navy? <laughs> it looks like black from far, but, um, and I'm wearing some black. The t-shirt's black, but, and my sneakers are black. But, um, but, um, but, being into color is a generalization or something that I don't mind. I don't mind when people make that assumption. Um, hmm. But it's like, if you're a woman, you don't have to dress like a woman all the time, you know? Right? If you're a, if you're a, a, a little person, you don't have to dress like a munchkin, you know what I mean? It's a little bit, you know, it's, it, there's a little bit of an assumption when you think like that I'm going to dress like Knight Landisman, who I love, and I, you know, no one would even know that Knight Landisman was even involved in the, in whatever world he's involved in. He just happens to be dressed in color from head to toe all the time, you know, and I appreciate that. And my apartment, it's funny because it's a different, it's mostly kind of amorphously white and not so colorful. And then it ends up that like my living room has a very like sort of subtle, distinct, like taupey, purpley feeling to it. Because to me that's like this crazy refined, like it's, it's a very, it's almost like a mistake. It's like when you go to dance class and you see those dancers in their clothes that have been washed so many times and they turn these insane, like, taupey colors that start as navy, so you can't understand how it became, like, pale pink taupe, right? Those, I think, are the best colors. But, I mean, your, your apartment also... Oh, and then there's a den that's madly red and kind of very, very Baroque in color, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um... And I designed this rug that's very, all colors of wool that's Ooh. so fabulous. Wow. That rug is beautiful. Yeah. Wow. And you know, speaking of like sketches, which there are in the show, I made a sketch of that rug, a hand sketch, and I brought it to the maker of the thing, and she was like, what is that? She got scared of it. <laughs> it was a scale drawing by hand with like gouache, you know, I used gouache, and she, she couldn't stand it. She had to like, um, you know, reproduce it by computer or else she just could not. She was this young lady and she just couldn't deal with it. She couldn't deal with a handmade sketch, which is fine. I mean, you know, but mm -hmm. sketches just, are a thing of the past. Just so. a word about the sketches, which is the other thing that, that were, you know, we, we saw the swatches that were all in the archive. The sketches are also all in Isaac's archive. And one after the other, they're absolutely gorgeous. And so we put a whole room aside together for those, those pieces. And I mean, in a way, because most people have never seen them before, they will have this, you'll have this moment when you go to the show and you see how beautiful his hand is, the, the oh, drawing. I, I've always thought that about you, Isaac. You have a beautiful hand. And, and well, it's, you it's, know, it's so funny about sketching and, um, the idea that I had this old shrink who you say the price of time, the price of love is time, the price of love is time. And I remember this about sketching, you know, you don't sketch, as a designer, you don't have that opportunity to sit in a room every single day and sketch. I mean, Myra does, right? right. And, you know, Eric Fischel does or right. something, right? But I don't. I mean, there are a lot of other things I do. I do fittings, I go to fabric appointments, I travel, I have TV shows, etc. But, you know, for each collection, I would sit there for days and sketch. And I would start sketching and just put ideas up, and it would become this like grand story about one really stupid idea, usually, right? <laughs> and it would be this like idea through, through taken through. And then after I finished, I would always like go, "Oh no, those sketches in the beginning are so ugly." Because by the time you put this time in to get your hand loose making the sketches, you want to redo all the sketches because you realize now you have this kind of rhythm about. So there is a physical part of that that I really like. 
that I miss a great deal that I'm going to be getting into again. I'm very happy to say. I hope so. I really yeah. do. Yeah. I yeah. will be. I will be doing I mean, you'll see in the show there are some of the sketches that are done in a hurry. Um, and you can see that, you know, the, f the, the pace of fashion, the fashion, the, the just the, the relentlessness of how fast it goes, um, that there's a new collection and then another new collection, that at some points those sketches got really fast loose. and loose. Fast and loose. And, and yeah. there's, a, there's an example of that, but there's still that quality of, of real assuredness of yes. what you were doing yes. and what you wanted to see. And, and who that woman is. And who that yeah. woman is mm -hmm. and, who, and what that dress is because it, it comes from his hand to the page and it, it's fully realized and it, it, there's really the idea hand page and there and then it's done and that is it so you had a question I have really had more of a comment I'm speaking of the sketches your television show yes yeah. that was my favorite thing oh ever. thank you that was such a great the way you had everything with the workroom oh yeah kitchen. it was so good was so funny. In the beginning of that show you use and at the end sometimes he would madly sketch pick somebody from yeah, the audience right. ask her a question about a dilemma they were having where they were going what party they were attending and you would whip out yeah. a, and a, I, like in 30 seconds i hated would, that i hated that oh, segment but it was oh so god i felt like a trained monkey doing oh, that oh no did. at home it was really <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I bet oh. and cuz people say that again and again i, I respect you I do I respect it but thing. but living through it was a nightmare and I used to tell the network and they were like no it's like what they really like we get a million letters and I was again that collie thing and the you ones know? that you were doing it for had no idea what they were having gifted <laughs> upon them <laughs> well, no, no, exactly. no concept of, you know they were just like thank yeah. you oh, and no, I'm like, oh, they were very appreciative just, oh. and I look back on <laughs> it and I think like I think you know it is something that I that I I regret not feeling good about when it was happening you know <laughs> yeah well, There's what happened more. was actually, what happened was, you know, um, we did it for three years and then it moved to another network. We did it for two years there. And then they kept saying, oh, we want you to do more makeovers. And I was like, but that's exactly the opposite of why I did this show, because I don't like makeovers. I hate the word. I hate everything about it, you know. And then this, by the end of the second season, all we were doing was makeovers. And it was like, I'm not doing this anymore, sadly. Yeah. Well, you were in the kitchen. Sorry. I agree. That was so yeah. good. And I learned how to cook a lot from that from those people, yeah. Hi, Isaac. I have a question Hi. or a comment first. Um, speaking about the dancers, I actually have a 16-year-old yeah. niece who's a pre-professional ballerina. So Your niece is a pre-professional yeah. ballerina. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Where is she? She's actually um, in Connecticut, but she trains with the Bolshoi as well. <laughs> and so I've seen wow. her costumes in those dirty tights up close. So, yeah. And then I came to understand that you had designed ballet costumes for ABT and so forth. So, oh, yeah. so my question is, what is your process being that you're you know, dealing now with music and maybe the athleticism of a dancer? And so is that different when you're designing those? You know, the process you call upon Right? It's at this point, as a costume designer, especially for something like ballet, it's first agreeing with a lot of things, with the company, you know, like that you agree with the company. It's an okay place, like you know it's not gonna suck, right? And then the auteur, like the choreographer, that's really important to me, who's making up the show, right? The music, right the idea and the last ballet I did with Mark Morris he's my best friend and we work together really fantastically and though we've never been romantically involved there is a romance between us there really is this kind of fantastic like you know romance when we work together and um, and I'm always very happy when I'm working with Mark because it's not my gig it's his gig and if it sucks it's his fault you know <laughs> and um, and it's hysterical because he showed me this music uh, it was such a good idea oh I forgot what it was what the music for this ballet was it was not personal no it was like 19th century and I can't remember what it was but it was exactly right for ballet and it felt it sounded very equestrian and I was doing these sketches of like horse costumes it was hilarious right and you know Mark was like mm, I don't know about horse costumes it was very funny right and I was sort of not really serious except we were having a big struggle about where ballet was and what the company was doing and why it was so difficult and why they had like such ugly legs all of a sudden and they're all so skinny you know, it's like a big 
t discussion between us about how it sucked, right? How everything sucks. And then at some point he came over and I was like, Mark, we can't start from a place where everything sucks. He was like, I know, I know, right? And so like at some point, like everybody just breathed and he started making up the dance. And then like I went to see a rehearsal and it was completely obvious what the thing was about, you know? And then that's where I, that's how I got the idea for the costumes, you know? That's what happened. So you see what I mean? It's exactly the opposite of instinctual. It's like political and, you know, but then it becomes instinctual at some point. Yeah. There, there are a lot of costumes in the exhibition. And one of the things we made sure to do was to give you a little excerpt from where they came from. So you see them as they were worn. When you see the show, you'll see that. And, and it, again, that brings it back to life with those, because costumes have to be worn. They really have to be worn. They're, they're sort of, otherwise, they're just dead on a mannequin or something like that. But they look really good um, in the exhibition, and then you see the you see how they were when they were conceived. They do look good in the exhibit, I must say. I we didn't have, think um, they would. I didn't think they would. I don't like mannequins. I really don't. I hate mannequins. I think mannequins are terrible representation of flesh and blood, you know, and especially for dancers because those are such specific bodies, you know, and we worked with a great installer. She is my favorite person, this woman, Tay. Yes. She's fantastic. She is, and she's great. at some point, like, you know, she will literally, like, cut mannequins up. She will chop them up, you know, <laughs> because it, the torso was too long and the legs were too long. It was the whole thing, you know, See, now you're giving away the secrets. Yes, yes, the secrets, okay. I, I was wondering how you, um, f how you feel the evolution of fashion that goes on to what people are actually wearing on the streets. Because when I look around New York, I see everybody's wearing skinny jeans, they're usually wearing half boots, yeah. they have an army jacket on, they have a t-shirt, like it feels like well, it's a uniform and it doesn't come from the runway, it doesn't come from no, the advertisement. No, no, luckily it doesn't come from the runway. It's not necessarily coming from what the stores are stocking, mm -hmm. but everybody's looking uniform. Well, um, you know, I would love to talk about that because I keep saying this. It's like, I don't see how that haute couture thing really influences anybody. You know, I don't really see it because it's just a bunch of gowns that are made for like photo ops, you know, and then you see people on the street, like all of a sudden wearing boots up to here or something. And that was not from a couture collection, I promise you, you know, and I'm not exactly sure where it comes from. I, I really am not. Um, I'm not sure if fashion ever really came from haute couture, right? Honestly, at this late stage in the game, I'm not sure what the hell fashion really is, you know? <laughs> I don't know what the hell it is. Like, you know, because, it, and if you look back on centuries, right, you look back at the 17th century and you kind of know what fashion was because you are looking back on it, you know? And you look back on the 1980s and you know what fashion was because you're looking back on it. But while we're going through it, it's really hard to tell what it means, right? Um, but it definitely is not at all related to fashion that comes down from like the top of the haute couture. It really is not. It really isn't. Do you agree or do you disagree? I mean, at least the way kind of most people on the street look, it's not influenced at all. I mean, and I guess for our moms, like in the 1950s and the 60s, there was a kind of influence, but it was so broad. You know, it's like tiny waists and big skirts and flats right. or whatever it was. I mean, that was like for 20 years, everybody right. wore that. You right. know what I mean? Or in the 1960s, everything got really sleek and sort of looked like Balenciaga, right? So there's one example of a designer really influencing the way the masses looked from up on high looking down, right. you know? But since then, and maybe like a little bit of that Saint Laurent thing, when he dressed women in those suits, those men, those mannish suits. Right. But a lot of people were doing that, so it can't, you can't really do, the, I can't really say, I can't say, I really can't. Don't you think that New York's gotten more fashionable? Yeah, I do. I think New York is the center of the world. I do. I always have, and now it's true. And, and, and 12th Street in particular. Yeah, and 12th Street is the vortex of it, yes. <laughs> so Kaylin has given me the wrap it up, the universal okay. sim symbol of wrap it up. Um, but I think that we um, get to invite you to sign a few books. Yes, I'm going to do it. Sign some books I here. I love it. Yes. Good. I'll, I'll say Yay. thank you for the strand. Thank, thank you, you strand. strand. Doing this. Yay, Sam. And thank you, Isaac. Thank you, G.